Uh, so thank you and welcome to our, what I think is going to be an absolutely outstanding and really, really interesting panel, kickstarting the Australian native food industry. I'll introduce my panellists and speakers shortly, but my name's Christine Pitt and I'm the CEO of Food Futures Company. And this is a particular passion of mine and I hope of yours also. So thanks to the 2014 book Dark Emu by Australian Indigenous author Bruce Pascoe, we now know that a sophisticated native food and agriculture and aquaculture production system has been existing here in Australia for many tens of thousands of years. However, despite there being more than 1,500 known edible native plants and many, many more that we don't know enough about to choose from, out of the world's top 150 crop plants, none are from Australia. For those of you who are here this morning listening to Howard Shapiro's discussion about orphan crops, we believe there, is, there exist significant opportunities. So Indigenous foods represents a globally important trend that has the potential to underpin the change to a more sustainable food production system, and at the same time to deliver food with a multitude of functional properties that have sustained the oldest surviving people on the planet. Today's presentations and panel discussions will shed light on the tremendous potential to develop a global native food industry here in Australia. We will hear about success stories, but also we'll gain some insights into the challenges and the importance of building strong partnerships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. We're going to start the session with three presentations and then follow with a panel discussion. For those of you who have not been exposed to Australian native foods or had the opportunity to go out on country, our panellists and presenters have shared some beautiful images with us. Before I invite our first speaker, Pat Torres, the CEO and Director of May Harvest and founding member of the Northern Australian Capitu Plum Alliance to give her presentation. Pat, if you could acknowledge the traditional owners on our collective behalf. So Ngaji Waraji, hello everybody. Um, Ngayu Mabungan, are you well? If you are, answer Mabungan. Mabunan. Wonderful. So Nyambaburu, Kulin Nation Ngainburu. So this is the land of the Kulin Nation people and on behalf of the Indigenous people here, I want to acknowledge that we are on other people's lands, the Kulin Nation people's lands, and that we acknowledge the elders, the emerging elders, the leaders, the youth, and all those non-Aboriginal people who've worked with us in partnership to get us to where we are today. Thank you. So, Christine, you want me to start? I do, thanks, Pat. Yeah. So, um, Nyamba, Buru, Jugangan, Yarungan. So, I'm from an area where the Jugan people and the Yaru people, which is the Broome region of Western Australia in the Kimberleys. My business is Mummijin Tree Enterprises, and I trade under the name Mai Harvest. So, Mai means bush foods in our area. And my Aboriginal name, Mumujin, is the um, bush tucker that's known as Mimisops elengi, which is a little red currant that grows in our rainforest areas of um, the Kimberley. So it's natural for me to actually work in the bush foods area. I'm one of the founding members for NACPA, which stands for Northern Australia Aboriginal Kakadu Plum Alliance. So it's an alliance that's supported by the Indigenous Land and Sea Council, which is a major supporter in terms of our individual businesses. So in our alliance, there are nine Aboriginal corporations and we work together collaboratively. We celebrated our first anniversary last month because we were established in August 2018. And since that time, we've had the amazing help of Paul Saiki, who has been like our business development manager with us. And we have been able to handle difficult areas like the HACIP audit, which means that we have to be food safe. It's an amazing, um, native food sits in a difficult space. Um, it's amazing that Indigenous foods are called new foods and novel foods. <laughs> but I can tell you that our foods go back 65,000 years at least. 
climate change has brought the sea levels up. So actually, you know, many of the um, anthropological and uh, geological and also, um, who's the guys that look at all the minerals and stuff? Um, our sites are greater than 40,000. Most seaside um, sites are around about 40,000. But if you take the sea levels down to where it was 25,000 years ago, you'll find more sites of ours that's longer than 40,000. So I come from um, an area of Western Australia where the Kakadu plum is the noted superfood of the world at the moment. It's been in the Australian native foods industry for more than 20 years. It's gone to Europe, gone and got the European Union stamp of approval. And in the past, many of the indigenous people have been harvesters only. So in our audience, I want to acknowledge our indigenous uh, members from NACA who are also here. We are now set up as Aboriginal corporations willing to be the industry leaders, and that means that we need to have a space and a place to be the leaders of indigenous foods. So lucky to say we have traveled amazing journeys in the last 10 years, you know, with an indigenous woman being the chairperson of ANFAB, Australian Native Food you know, and, and Bot Botanicals, and I was there a few years ago when it was called ANFL. So, We've done the journey. Now we have Indigenous perspectives coming through very strongly. This, of course, will upset a few people. Well, we're not about upsetting people. We're, ups we're actually about collaboration. We're talking about partnerships. We're talking about joint ventures. And everything that Dr Shapiro said this morning is so relevant to us. So Africa has always been, you know, someone points to Africa and all these great works gets done. Well, we need great works to happen in Australia, so I'm inviting you as future collaborators and future architects of change to actually work with Indigenous companies to get this kick-starting the native food industry in the right place. When Dr Shapiro talked about zinc, magnesium, calcium, phosphorus, all those trace elements that is needed for human growth and human brain, guess what? You look at indigenous foods and what do you find? It's all there in its natural form. It doesn't have to be created synthetically. It's actually there. So we need the industry to grow in partnership with people like-minded, but also those people who know how to do the journey with us and don't continue oppressive practices that has happened to us in the past. We want to go forward with equal partnership we want to look at benefit sharing. We want to look at contractual supplies. And we want to look at buy-in and investment where both of us um, get benefit from it. Not just, we're no longer just want to be the harvesters who get a small fee. We actually want to be um, creators of products and we want to create opportunities for all of our families. So our families who do the wild harvesting, we are custodians of our fruit. My people have got stories, beautiful stories, coming from the Bugarigara. Bugarigara is the European concept of dream time. And it's the actual ancestral stories of creation. And in our region, it was the two sisters, the Gudidingunu, with their old mother, that walked the country, that planted trees as they walked along. They sang, they danced, they painted, and they created different trees along the environment related to us. So the gubbing is a love story. So in our region, we have a red gubbing. Not many of you would have heard about that because the industry wants the green one. And the red gubbing is actually a love affair that happened between Terminalia pitilaris and Terminalia ferdinandiana. So one is a coastal murrel, that's the language for us, the murrel, and then the coast of Gubbin. So Gubbin was a man and murrel was the woman. They made love and what did they create? The hybrid. So that happened over a period of time as scientists would know. And guess what? We have a special story. Now that kind of story is what makes our branding very, very um, important. And so when people come to speak with us, we're giving you more than a commodity. The fruit is not just a commodity to be bought and sold. It also has incredible history that goes back many, many years. And guess what? I'm over my time. 
<laughs> I can talk for hours. <laughs> Very well done. Thanks, Pat, for keeping over time and thank you for sharing that story. That was amazing. Um, our next speaker is Derek Walker. Uh, Derek's the director of the Kuti Company, a wild harvest seafood producer. And I think when we're thinking about native foods, we don't always think about seafood or protein as well as native plants. And so we're getting a bit of a uh, diversity of perspective today in terms of some of the products. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. Nuri Ander, Mimi Kony. Namoi Mik Chi, Derek Nopamoli, Alunik Runri Rui Kulin Nation. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Derek Walker, and I acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. <clears throat> I just wanted to pay respects to them. Um, I come from Raukum, which is situated in the lower lakes and Kurong region in South Australia on the banks of Lake Alexandrina. And just to give you a little bit more context, I asked my brothers and sisters in the back, uh, in the back room there, in the green room, whether they had a $50 note, and none of them could come up with a $50 note. So has anyone got a $50 note on them? And anyone pull it out, show it around. Just... You don't have to give it away, just show well, it. Well, no, I want one of them. I want, I, I want one of them. There's, there's one. Can we, can, we, can we get a $50 note? Thank you. That's good, that, that'll come in handy later. <laughs> but um, no, we'll, we'll get that back. So just to give you a little bit of context, on the $50 note, there's a man on the front uh, and some shears and there's a church, that church I got married to my lovely wife um, a number of years ago. And uh, the man on there is a man by the name of David Janipen and he was a... Uh, he was an inventor, he was a preacher, he was an expert in uh, ballistics and Greek mythology. He was a publisher, well written, um, and he was born 13 years after Raukum was settled as a mission. So he was born in the 1800s. In about 1913, there was a royal commission into, um, into the Aborigines, and at that royal commission, David stepped up and, uh, and he talked about a number of things. He talked about food security for the community because in those days it was rations. Rations were handed out um, and, and people made the most of what they had. And, and what they asked him, whether there was an opportunity around fishing and fishing rights. And um, the thought was that they would re reserve a section of the lake and the fishing area on the Coorong for Aborigines. He said, look, that'd be a really good thing. The old people reckon that'd be, that'd be great. We would access land that we've accessed for 50,000 years. Um, and so that was put, put to the Royal Commission and there were a number of other things that he talked about. Um, and what happened around access to fishing and fishing rights was that uh, in the, when regulation came in, we were given one net for the nation. So we had a net, one single net, to undertake fishing in the Coorong. Um, and just to finish on the, on the David Unipin bit, he said, as a full-blooded member of my race, I think I may claim to be the first, but I hope not the last, to produce an enduring record of our customs, beliefs and imaginings. <clears throat> and it was his imaginings as an inventor that enabled him to patent a number of items, and one of them was, in the middle of a shearing handpiece is a, is a piece that turns circular motion into shearing action. This country was found on the back of the sheep and uh, he was the man that patented that particular bit of um, machinery. So he's quite an incredible man and so it's on the, on the, on the shoulders of those sorts of men that uh, we do the things that we do. My topic today is kickstarting the Australian native food industry well, we've been at this for about 50,000 years, so we're coming from a long way back uh, in preparing for this day. But um, I, just, I just need to tell you a little bit of background about, uh, about us, um, keeping an eye on the time. Um, you know, on January the 8th, 1992, I was involved in the development of a 
the Ralkin Managing Propriety Limited Company, which meant I went back home. It was after studying at uh, Rosewood Agricultural College, um, and I, I was there for three years. A very difficult time. I was right in the middle of land rights. So we had, um, we had uh, the young Liberals putting posters up saying, this man's trying to steal your land. Um, and a number, of, a number of other things. And so it was a, it was a really, really tough time. But uh, my focus, I had a family and I had poor children, was to feed them. So I was going to get through regardless of, of what the situation was. And so um, at the start of Raukin, where I went back home and again we got onto property that had been basically flogged, run down, no fences, no water points. Um, and we started about developing uh, what, uh, what is Raukan lands. From 1992 to 1997, we went from no cattle and a bit of doubt and a bit of debt and a bit of despair into running about 800 uh, head of cattle. We were cropping about 1,500 head. We were growing a summer in the vicinity of 1,000 tonnes of potatoes, um, maize, corn and sorghum. <coughs> which was, um, which in a really short space of time was, um, was uh, it happened quite quickly. And it was through the support of programs like CDEP, so Community Development Employment Program, that enabled us to, to get some support to develop the property. Um, as part of that, pro after that program, we, uh, we ran a Working on Country uh, program for a number of years. We still run that. There are people working on country uh, undertaking natural, natural resource management. And as part of that process, we, we have a school-based apprenticeship process and a thing called an Aboriginal Learning on Country program. So we have a pathway feeding young people into, into working on our country. It was out of that process that um, we were able to, to develop up a program that enabled us to collect wild bush tucker. So, as part of a Jarwin process, we, um, we branded it. It was called Wild Eats. One of the things that, that we found quite difficult was getting enough volume into the market to make a difference, but also to pay the people that were undertaking the work. That was, that was quite a difficult thing. And so out of the Wild Eats program came uh, Yuntawallan, which means coming together, and the, we ended into a partnership with APIC, Australian Wildflowers Investment Corporation, to sell wildflowers into the market. Um, and we will, our current um, partnership is identifying 62 FTEs in five years' time. Um, we believe that'll be a real opportunity for, for our mob. Along the way, we ran into um, a group called the Goodwill Pipico, and they enabled us to partner up around what I'm meant to be talking about, which is goodies. Um, but I needed to tell you a little bit about that background because things were quite difficult. Ecologically, there have been changes. There are greater changes in the last 30 years in our, in the last 30 years than ever in any time in history. For the first time ever, the Murray Mouth is about, was about to close and they're using mechanical means to keep it open. And so there's, significant amount of change. In the southern end of the Coorong, we have banded stilts coming in, birds that never been there, and they're coming there because of the brine shrimp, because it's hypersaline. And so there's this whole ecological change. And what we understand is that cultural character is linked to ecological character, and, we, and we're seeing the diminishing of some of that, and it was really concerning for us. So um, I'm realising the time. Getting on to Kutiko, um, in 2016, we got a phone call from uh, Google Pipico and the chairman, a bloke by the name of Roger Edwards, um, basically said, look, um, we understand we're harvesting uh, on your country, uh, bearing in mind that native title was coming. They knew that, they knew it was happening, they were going, they crossed, they were, they were harvesting on our country, um, and they wanted, they saw it as, they did a SWOT analysis, they saw it as a threat, and so we, um, so to, to mitigate, mitigate that threat, they, um, they decided to work together with us. Um, out of that, we were, an, we were able to buy into the company. I'm now a director of 
Google Pipico, but as part of that process around acquiring quota and with the support of our backers, Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation, we were able to buy more quota. So we now are 7% owners of the whole of the industry um, by, if it all works well, um, by the time I get back into Adelaide and within another couple of weeks, we'll be about 12 or 13% owners. And we're, uh, our goal and the goal of the Google Pipico is that we'll be 25% owners of the whole of the industry um, within two years' time. So we see that that growth has happened quite quickly. The return on investment is, um, is uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 15%, and we think that we can grow uh, that industry. Now, kutis are a, um, are a food source that we um, harvested for 50,000 years. We did a dig in a midden, and we worked out how much protein source was in that midden, and we, it, they calculated, a university calculated this, that there was enough protein source to feed a family of Nutanjali every day for 1,600 years. So we understand that that was part of our economy, our cultural economy. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> I don't think any of the other speakers are getting paid, so Derek, you might have to uh, share That's that around. <laughs> So the final presenter in this first part of the session is, and you're really going to enjoy this one, not that you haven't enjoyed the first two, but this one's going to be a bit special. Uh, so Suzanne Thompson, so if you can come up, Suzanne. Suzanne is the chair of the industry body, the Australian Native Foods and Botanicals. And those of us on the board with Suzanne um, recently went away for a two-day retreat. And I can tell you we didn't laugh so much <laughs> as we did then. So she's going to uh, surprise you and also inspire you. Thanks, But I don't Suzanne. think I'll tell my jokes. Oh, no, no. I think they're, no, fun. they're tonight, definitely no. women-only jokes. Definitely yeah. not. Definitely. <laughs> Maybe later in private if somebody <laughs> wants to know. But, um, yeah, anyway. Mikini <laughs> Budal. <laughs> <laughs> Naka iningi gachu yamba, waku yintu yandu gaya waja, binda yaka gachu yambaka. It's good today. I am iningi. That is my country. But you and I, we will sit, we will walk, and we will talk together on country, especially here on the country we sit today. So, as I stand here today, I stand here with the encouragement, strength and resilience of my ancestors. So where did it begin for my people? At the beginning of the dream time, Burl, our great creator, created a great explosion in the sky and dispersed across the sky all of our sky ancestral spirit beings, but created one special one called Marangani, the star polisher the one who would polish our ancestors so we could always see them shining bright on us as we did ceremony on this land. But when we were ready to go to the sky world, would come down as the shooting star to collect us and take us back up into the Milky Way. So as I look out over this great country of, our, of ours that we call Australia, I see nothing but an edible landscape. So, for many a millennia, Aboriginal clans across Australia have found ways to survive in this vast continent through the gathering of detailed knowledge of the environment in which we lived. Our understanding of native foods goes far beyond just knowing that they are edible, but also which plants are harmful and the need for careful consideration of the processes for preparation. We used plants for not only, not only just healing, medicine, foods and weapons, but also for shelter and seasonal migration of animals for their own survival and maintenance for caring of our country. So, let me share a personal story with you about my hometown, Bark Alden. A few years ago, I was asked if I could present a bush tucker talk at our garden expo. As you can see, 
The knowledge that I gather comes from these people that I share with you on the screen. So I go 500 metres outside of town into the town common and I came back in and now we're in drought, the longest drought. And I came back in with 28 different varieties of specimens of bush foods and bush medicine plants. Because you see, this was 70% of my people's diet. And the message that I said to the town folk was we're in drought for cattle and sheep. We're not caring for our country. We need to care for our country. We need to care for our water. So for our first peoples, ancestors of this land, 80% of their diet was supplied by the many plants within our desert regions and as little as 40% in the coastal areas where shellfish, fish and game were abundant. Our diets and foods varied from one region to another and also from one tribe to another. Local customs and beliefs also affected what was hunted and gathered, for example, we would not eat our moiety, our totem. For my people, before the arrival of the settler, our people needed very little medicine or medication. Only occasionally we required digestive, fever, toothaches, sores, colds, or wound treatments, which were treated with bush medicines through the applications of rubs, poultices, or inhaled by using crushed aromic leaves. So for us, food has always been integrated to some extent in Australian food culture. It is certainly true that in the colonial times, those settlers who learnt about local foods from the Aboriginal people in their area used them or who experimented for themselves fared much better than those who did not. So however, at a time as time progressed and supplies of exotic food became, foodstuffs became more accessible, this knowledge was ignored. As transport links developed, even country cooks abandoned the use of the wild foods which could not compete with those of overseas origins in terms of harvestable quantities and culinary delights. So just a little quick fact, and I'm sure a lot of you would know about that, is that almost every Australian knows that Burke and Wills starved to death. However, what they didn't know is that their death was as a result of rejecting the Aboriginal methods for preparing the Nardu fern. So looking into the future, let's consider how we as First Australians coexist and lead and share the benefits. For a First Australian, the Australian landscape is our supermarket, our sporting field, our factories, our places of worship, our places of healing, our places of learning, our places of birthing, our places of retirement, and our places of ceremony. So our first Australian ancestors were powerful observers of the comp competent botan uh, were, and were competent botanists, sorry, designers, architects, scientists, and clever law keepers. This learning was through the trial of plant and non-plant substances for evidence of their healing value. I know in growing up in that time, I don't know if I would have liked to have been the guinea pig, but that was part of our process of learning as a people. But gradually, all of this knowledge was collated and passed down to the many generations ahead. Today, we continue to trial and share this knowledge with people like yourselves and, of course, Anne Fab, who I now chair. Did you know that there was a very special time for the collection of our plants, as this meant that the chemical content according to the maturation or to the season of the year or the soil type the ritual of collecting leaves, seeds, roots, pods, bark, is the secret business of each tribe, which also ensured the ownership of the country in which the plants grew. We had song lines, we had a law that governed this land. I'll just flick through. So let's think about this for a moment. Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu 
provides us with the argument for consideration that my people were not just hunters and gatherers for the justification of dispossession. Pasco attempts to rebuke the colonial myths of terra nullius by providing compelling evidence from the diaries of explorers that suggest that systems of food production and land management have been brutally misunderstood or understated in modern retellings of early Aboriginal history and that a new look at Australia's past is required. So if we are truly going to embrace our future as a country together, then we must consider when we are building our nation that our first Australians have been dispossessed devalued and had their knowledge and wisdom misrepresented. We must rebuild this trust with my people and the way forward to support the very concept of benefit sharing for the design of our future in the native foods industry. So as Chair of the Australian Native Foods and Botanicals, I aim to lead the way in addressing not only the opportunity to close the gap, but to ensure that our First Peoples communities are afforded the opportunity to build enterprises within the native foods and botanical space through access and benefit sharing with us all. So I'll just end in saying that um, I am a very proud Aboriginal woman and a little bit on who ANFAB are. So ANFAB is the peak national representative body and we've just recently and been working very closely with the Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation, which you would have heard, um, you know, my, my um, fellow brothers and sisters talk about. Um, it, we have a massive task ahead of us and I think the task that I put out to all of us is how we collaborate and how we collaborate on this very challenging journey ahead because remembering my people do exist in this space and they hold that secret, sacred knowledge. So in saying that, I'm going to get you all to stand up. So it wouldn't be fitting of us not to share something with you. So this dance was actually created at the time. So I come from, so in Queensland, so Kingaroy. Peanut country. So good old Joe Bjorki Peterson country. So my aunties and uncles created this dance about when they're out in the peanut picking fields and they weren't allowed to eat the food, their traditional food, because remember, we weren't allowed to speak our language, we weren't allowed to practice our culture. So they'd go out and they would be picking all of our food and then they would be thanking. But then, all of a sudden, they'd go Wadugi. Now Wadugi is hiding from the white fella. So we would start down here, but before we start, we need some music. So I reckon I'll start with the sisters first. And because the sisters, we got some good rhythm, don't we? So if we just clap our hands, get a bit of a beat. Now, Andy, brother, it's men's business. I need somebody to lead the charge with the didgeridoo. You know, give a bit of a mmm. Get them brothers going mmm. So get all the men going. So, all right. So what we would do then is we would say mei, mei, madiri. So when we say mei madiri, we're down here and we're picking. So we're going mei madiri, mei madiri. And so we're gonna, we'll come here and we'll go mara malanga. Mara malanga, mara malanga. And then we're gonna go up here and we say burol balingu. Burol balingu, burol balingu. And then we go wadugi, wadugi. Okay, so we're gonna do Mei Madiri, Mara Malanga, Burul Balingu four times each. Okay, and we'll just do one run through really quickly because we're running out of time. And let's get this dance done. Okay, you ready? You all remember it? Right. <laughs> Mei Madiri, Mei Madiri, Mei Madiri, Mei Madiri, Mara Malanga, 
Maramalanga, 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 Beryl Balingu, Beryl Balingu, Beryl Balingu, Beryl Balingu, Wadogi, Wadogi. Thank you. I told you you'd have a bit of fun with Suzanne. <laughs> Thank you. If you're really interested, get her to tell you some of her women's only jokes later. <laughs> They're a bit risque for this crowd, I think. <laughs> so what I'd like to, I hope you really um, valued that presentation. What we wanted to do, because we weren't sure how much the uh, you participants in the audience today would know about Australian native foods and botanicals, the history of it, um, the diversity. So we felt that it was really important to set that context um, so that we can all now share in a conversation. So I'd like to invite, oh, sorry, not invite, I'll introduce our extra three panellists um, to join the conversation now. So starting from my far left, we have Professor Andy Lowe, who's the Director of Agri-Food and Wine at the University of Adelaide in South Australia. We then have Topaz McAuliffe, who's the Indigenous Business Development Manager for the major supermarket chain Coles, and Kevin Williams, who's the Economic Development Officer of the Nuranda uh, Aboriginal Corporation. So thanks for joining us. So I'm just going to bring you three into the conversation and then we'll open it up a bit. And I'd also invite the audience to think about some questions uh, for towards the end of the panel. So Andy, starting with you. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the soon to be released Australian Native Food Database and how you see scientific research complementing or being complemented by traditional cultural knowledge held by Indigenous Australians in native foods and in particular what you see are some of the key challenges we should be aware of in blending these two sources of knowledge? Yeah. So it's a good question to start with, uh, I think. So. Look, if we look at the, uh, uh, the Australian uh, plants here, uh, we probably have some, somewhere like 30,000 plants uh, within Australia, um, and uh, probably about uh, 1,500 to uh, up to 5,000 are actually used for uh, food or for some kind of medicinal usage. So that's, that's quite a large proportion of uh, the plants that grow naturally uh, here in Australia. I'd probably pick up just on one of the points that was made earlier uh, by one of the speakers. Uh, so 90% of the crops we now grow uh, here in Australia have come from another continent. So uh, we haven't used uh, that knowledge, we haven't integrated that knowledge within the crop production uh, here uh, within Australia. It's uh, with some of the uh, early settlers uh, integrated that, but that's been lost uh, over time. We've been uh, in the process over the, the last two years at uh, looking at and understanding which plants um, and also some of the fungi uh, and some of the insects uh, have been uh, consumed and uh, where there's good uh, records and evidence uh, for the consumption of a range of species for food, so classic bush tucker. Uh, uh, that information has been compiled uh, together uh, within a database um, of 1,500 uh, plant species. Now we are still in the process of finalising that. We did hope uh, that we would actually finish the task, uh, ready for a launch of that database uh, at this conference, but uh, the task isn't quite complete, but we hope to uh, be releasing that uh, in the next two months or so. So certainly watch this space uh, for the release of that. And what, what type of information uh, is within there? There's many uh, documented um, scientific publications uh, around the usage uh, of those plants, uh, where those plants can be grown, um, and also some of that preparation uh, uh, methods that uh, are also in there. Now, as uh, some of the speakers have talked about today, some of that information is culturally sensitive. So some of that information is uh, secret information. It's information that is the knowledge of a particular community. So in bringing together a database like this, uh, we also had an advisory group that was uh, uh, with uh, external advisors. Uh, we had uh, uh, members from AMFAB and also from ILSC uh, and other uh, indigenous uh, leaders just guiding uh, the process for that. We will look at a, a, a limited release of that information, the top 100 uh, species, really to promote uh, the richness and diversity uh, of plant species there. But because much of that information uh, is, uh, in the first cases, uh, culturally sensitive, then that information 
uh, can't be released in, in its full, uh, full scope. But the other, uh, the other issue is if uh, that information uh, is released fully, then it can provide a kind of open slather for commercialization for that information. And uh, I think this type of information um, is best released through entities like uh, AMFAB and through ILSC and, and other organizations where access to the information can be accessed primarily uh, or in conjunction with uh, indigenous producers that can actually utilize uh, and uh, make a first uh, use uh, of this information and then really help drive uh, a native food industry that's going to be supporting uh, indigenous producers in that way. So as Pat said, not just pickers, but producers and business owners uh, that uh, will use this information. We still have a bit of a way to go to work out uh, some of those sensitivities and exactly the business model with that. But in terms of kickstarting uh, the Australian native food industry, this information is available, it's inf and it's available to underpin uh, the Australian native food industry. Time is good now for that industry to really get developed. We've seen maybe a bit of a cyclical uh, phase of uh, bush tucker that started uh, really in the 80s, but now it's a much more sophisticated uh, business. We're seeing many uh, business owners, uh, many businesses really promoting uh, indigenous uh, native foods, uh, and uh, also that requires a sophisticated sophistication of uh, the consumer, a sophistication of production, uh, and also investment to really bring uh, th those crops to the world. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I think I, mean, I think it is so important, isn't it, to have that level of, of integrity under, underpinning that data, underpinning any kind of industry growth strategy. And so I think for the first time, we're really starting to integrate that and uh, in, in an appropriate way for the first time, also making that knowledge available to those who are looking to innovate around uh, native foods and to do that in an appropriate way that Suzanne talked about in collaboration. So Topaz, I might come to you next if that's okay. Um, so you're kind of working at the really commercial end of the food value chain, which is really interesting. And I think we've all understood and heard that there is significant demand for Australian native foods from export markets. It seems that sometimes our neighbours understand these opportunities and the value proposition that native foods brings from a food and health point of view better than we do. Um, and it's still a bit of a niche industry here. Do you have any kind of sense of why you think that might be the case? Uh, yeah, I just think consumers are not familiar with how to use the product. So, um, you know, I often ask, uh, get asked, why don't you just stick it on MasterChef and everybody will use it? But it just doesn't work that way, especially when you've got ingredients that, um, you know, the, to get the best out of them, there are particular ways and techniques that you need to use them. And so I think um, it's a consumer... It has to be consumer-led, but in order for consumers to be comfortable, they need to be educated and they need to understand it and they need to find it accessible. Um, and the, the traditional methods of that more recently have been you'll have your chefs like Ben Shuri and Attica and um, showing you what can be done with that ingredient. But also I think the important part is about respecting the supply chain, which is what we've spoken about. So um, I think there is a tipping point happening at the moment where if we use wattle seed as an example, um, it can be grown and harvested and also stored. So, you know, doing something like a wattle seed bread on a national scale for someone like Coles isn't that far out of reach. But having enough su supply to do something that we could put in every store it is where that tipping point is at the moment. So similar to some of the kakadu plum stuff, uh, it's about how much are we harvesting, how much are we using, what are the markets that we're going to be putting it in. Um, and as an example, if you think about your really um, kind of healthy Asian broths, every one of those botanicals is here in Australia. So I think it's about, one, creating awareness with your general consumer, so not the cooks that like to go and experiment and are off down to the farmer's markets. It's the ones that they pop into Coles to do their family shop because they don't really have enough time on their hands to um, source these ingredients. And so I think the trick is how do we make it accessible and it becomes a pantry item. Mm. Um, and, and appetite's definitely there, but if you think about an ingredient ingredient like quinoa, you know, 10 years ago, there's no way people would have been cooking with it. But now it's just a staple across Australian diets. So I think it is definitely about um, educating um, our consumers, uh, but also to, um, if you think about the, uh, a lot of the larger supply out there are, are non-Indigenous growers. So the challenge with growing the supply chain um, to a commercial level, I, I don't think, and as we've mentioned before, um, can be done just by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It needs to be done by legitimate 
partnerships um, where the supply chain can be followed back to, you know, the provenance where we know that it's actually supporting communities, but they're also for us to scale up. Um, I think uh, absolutely hearing the speakers today, they're aware that um, everybody needs to do this together. Um, and there is a bush food revolution with Australian ingredients. It's just not happening here in Australia. The ingredients are on plates all over the world at some of the best restaurants in the world. So, yeah, but definitely appetite. I think there's a tipping point at the moment. Yeah, that's great. And it's a great segue, Kevin, if I can um, just oh, turn to you. Okay. You're, you've got an interesting uh, experiment, I think, that you're undertaking at the moment in taking... Uh, wattle seed, which uh, Topaz has just referred to, from a wild harvest into a truly commercial uh, situation. And I know you're at fairly early stages there, but you're already getting, you told me a story about 20 Chinese who came and spent quite a considerable amount of time in your town. So could you just share sort of how that's working, going from a wild harvest into a commercial uh, yeah, operation? Um, just a little bit about myself. I, um my name's Kim Boyle. The organisation I'm from is Nyundar Aboriginal Corporation, we, which is in Echuca in country Victoria. We're a, in a small country town in, on the Murray River. Uh, the property we have is about 320 acres, and um, what we've done um, and through um, meeting some people in the last few years, and one of them is a, a consultant, at, uh, Peter Cunningham, that worked for World Vision and is a, uh, arguably probably one of the leading wattle tree experts in the country. And... Um, We've sort of um, utilised to start off our project. We the property was the sale of water to kick it off, and we put in a hectare of uh, wattle trees to start it off. And um, the first hectare we put in was um, Acacia Victoria, and uh, we sort of, as it's saying, it's an experiment because we've had the property for forty odd years, and we haven't done a lot with it, and it's been um, utilised for cutting hay and things like that. And so. Um, for our community, we're, um, the organisation I work for is a, a service provider, so and we employ roughly 100 community members uh, within the organisation, and um, we're conscious of the thing that we need to do over the next 5, 10, 20 years for our community, as that creates areas of employment for our mob. And um, the Wattle Tree Project is an experiment in that area, and um, we've got two. Uh, uh, we've did the first hectare, then the next hectare we put in um, Fort about 17 different species um, uh, with Kudamundra wattle, um, uh, golden wattle. We've got some trees from Western Australia that we planted, a mulga and the one from roughly in the Pilbara area that died off the sort of, went back in the first year with the frost. They've lasted two years now, so we know with the uh, last another 12 months that um, when we get ready to harvest, we'll probably be able to the only trees from that are growing in Victoria that are from that area. The third, third and fourth hectare we put in Cootamundra wattle and acacia, uh, Cootamundra wattle and golden wattle, and we put in some river mint and, and thyme. We've got some salt bush growing, and um, by the end of the year we'll have the, the last two hectares put in, which will be Cootamundra wattle and uh, golden wattle. And the big thing for me coming to, to, to uh, the invitation down, I kept reading on, will I come down or not, or will I come down or not, and uh, I was reading it, and then um, uh, the great thing for me to come down and um, the people that I've met that are on this panel uh, uh, are fantastic people in regards to what Aboriginal people and communities are doing in, in this space in Australia. The interesting thing for me is walking around the stalls and there's no Aboriginal stalls there to say what's happening with Aboriginal communities in Australia. Um, the thing about this, uh, this expo is it's a sister city relationship with Milan and you're talking about food that's internationally um, used uh, and um, what's happening in Australia and I see some of the, the stalls that talk about the superfood with the wattle seed and all that and that's fantastic and it's, and it's great for all of your businesses to have all of that and, that. Um, and what I see for us as, a, as an Aboriginal community I want us to be part of that industry that happens in the next five to ten years and I want our, our organisation, our community and the story that is about us and our community and where we come from and, and, um, and I'd like to say to my auntie that helped kick off this organisation 40 odd years ago is that we have a business that we've got in our community that's using a native food that's ours that we're growing uh, and, we, and out of that from the income that we generate from the seed, we're putting it into employment opportunities for our kids. We're supporting our kids to go through school. We're supporting our community with education, sport and things like that. You know, um, they're the things that I'd like to think that we'd be able to do in the next 5, 10, 15. And hearing that companies such as Coles are interested in buying wattle seed to for, say, bread if there's enough in the industry. So the people that I've been working with um, 
are talking to farmers, like in the Sunraysia, they're talking to them about the drought that's happened that need, they need to diversify and put in crops that will grow in them areas without the, too much effect from the drought. So, you know, so what they're talking about is creating a huge wealth of wattle seed for things such as to, to be enough to, for the bread. And that. What I want to be is part of that. And I want to be able to come to the expo next year and the year after and then the year after and be part of the panel that have stalls here. But I also want to go to Milan and tell them about what we're doing in Australia with ours. So, so for us, it's exciting. For me, personally, it's exciting to meet the people I've met here today, to listen to the people that we've met um, through the last two days and to think that there's potential for us as a small Aboriginal community in Echuca to be part of this and, uh, and, and um, uh, over the next few years. It's, for me, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, that's great. Fun. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm going to ask the panel one more question and then I'll take it uh, to the audience. There are microphones, I understand. I can't see them because the light's in my eyes, but there are apparently microphones in the aisles. Um, so if you'd like to... Um, ask a question. I can see one mic over there. So if you wouldn't mind uh, moving towards a microphone. And, and uh, I think Kevin's just issued a real challenge to those of you in the audience. Uh, so we've got Coles up on the stage. We've got food companies that I know of in the audience. There's a real opportunity here. It's, it, you know, the consumers are telling us that these are the kinds of superfoods they want. We know that we can produce this kind of crop in a very sustainable production system uh, that's totally adapted to the Australian climate and, you know, geography. Uh, there's nothing really that should be holding us back. So I'm just going to ask Suzanne, and I'm putting you on the spot a little here, um, what do you think needs to happen or how can we encourage this greater level of commercial engagement together between non-Indigenous and Indigenous people um, and, you know, get more investment into the industry but get more partnerships, I suppose, that are of a commercial nature because I think that's probably where we really need to be heading as well. I think um, it's quite that's quite a big um, a big question. Um, I think for me, though, I think well, when we come back to collaboration, but I know with the direction and and what's really important for both ANFAB and the ILSC is, you know, how we, you know, in that you know coming together um, to look at the creation of something that is about addressing the industry. So of course we need to also consider a policy shift within um, our federal government, because there are many layers and levels within this space um, for any um, agency or any, you know, party to actually embark on. We've got, you know, relationships with the university. So I think, I think first and foremost, I think we need to be brave enough to come together at the table and to sit down and to start to look at um, a structure. Because ANFAB cannot do it alone. Um, but I also think um, I encourage people to become members of AMFAB because the more we have members that are there, the more we can actually start to filter that information out to our members, but we can also provide them with some best practice and lead in that way. So um, I think for me, but I think in, in picking up with what Kevin was saying is I think also putting the challenge out there, that global table and seeds and chips, that we're not a little next year, we're not actually a little panel session, that we actually have a, 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 a quite an impressive space that is representative of our growers, of our suppliers, of everything that is Australian native foods. And I think also being uh, brave enough to also look at Brand Australia, because I think we're in a very unique position to have Australian native foods and botanicals become truly that Brand Australia. Um, and I think then through that process um, and that truth-telling process too, that, um, that gives us an opportunity to celebrate everything Australian as everything that we, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, I think. So, um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, Thanks. Andy, you had uh, something you wanted to share there? Just something to add as well. And mm -hmm. I think um, it's really interesting to hear from Kevin about uh, the movement from wild harvest to plantation uh, as well. And... Uh, you know, that uh, represents a sophistication uh, of the production side. So just looking in, you know, the consumer side uh, and the production side uh, elements. Um, of course, with uh, Bruce Pascoe's um, uh, 
highlights really from uh, the book Dark Emu, there was a sophisticated supply, and chain, uh, supply chain here that existed. Uh, there was selection for uh, some of the best varieties. Um, but uh, there's to be able to compete with some of the commercial varieties that are out there from um, uh, alien species that have been introduced uh, here into Australia and represent the crop species, there will need to be further development of new varieties uh, that may be sweeter, may have larger fruits, may have higher productivity. Now, that doesn't happen by accident. That requires investment uh, to, to fund that. And uh, we saw this morning also uh, Howard Yanni Shapiro talk about uh, the orphaned uh, crops of Africa. So the 100 crops uh, that will be the next phase of domestication, I think what we need is uh, an orphan crops of Australia. We need a focus on the top 100 that we can bring forward for a domestication and selection uh, process that then really will uh, allow those crops to compete with the other crops that have had uh, that type of breeding. And one of the things that Howard emphasised is we actually have the genetic techniques now that can fast track that type of selection. So, uh, but of course that will also need investment and partnership. Mm, absolutely. And I think the government's sort of taking a little bit Well, I think seriously. we should ask them. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to see if there's anyone in the audience who would like to take the opportunity to ask a question. Yes, if you could come, there's a microphone just at the front there. Just um, say your name and who you'd like the question to or just generally to the panel, please. Hi, my name's Rose Wright. Um, I love this panel discussion and I think there's so much opportunity. I, I, I think this is to the whole panel, but possibly... Um, one of you may want to choose to answer it. Um, in Europe, they do a wonderful job at protecting uh, food traditions and food recipes and, and, of course, restrict the rest of the world from accessing their brand names and their product names. Um, I see there's enormous opportunity for Australia to actually protect the intellectual property rights of millennia of work that's been done in developing these species. And then the potential then, not just for Aboriginal communities to grow the product, but to license the production on a larger scale and, and develop that. What can we do to help? Is that being done? And what can we do to help make that happen? Um, we might get one of the mics up, up this end if we could, if you wouldn't mind. Pat, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, I'll just share like a little bit about that that I know, but I'm sure all of the panel will all have a bit to interject. So this thing, what I understand is the Australian government so the Nagoya Protocol, I think, is one of those really important um, protocols and agreements that haven't, they haven't in, um, engaged with. Um, I know, though, the Queensland Government are currently rewriting the Biodiscovery Act. So that's in response to the Nagoya Protocol, which is about the shared benefits. So that's a start, but that is that key piece of work that needs to be done. So pressure on the government. Um, you know, is, is that. But I think if we're all mindful of it and we all start to lead the way with it, I think, you know, is not waiting for something to shift and change there, but I think if we all take responsibilities as individuals in this space, I think we can lead the way um, with the shared benefit. Um, so does anybody else? Pat, so yep. that's, that's exactly where we're at with our NACPA group. Um, we're looking at um, shared benefit contracts and that's what we've been able to do with the assistance of the Indigenous Land and Sea Council. We're interested in the concept of provenance and protecting plants that's endemic to an area because of this really strong connection, the cultural connection. And so us as an alliance have gone down the um, path already of looking at um, testing for the um, DNA, the genome in our plants because we want to have a fingerprint specifically of our different fruits. So the Kakadu plum, even though it has a common name, Ferdinandiana, um, Terminalia Ferdinandiana, there's actually different species and there's different colours, there's different shapes that grow in certain environments. So that in itself has their own fingerprints that connect with the soil, the climate and the environment that they're growing in. So this is where what we're addressing as an alliance. So. We've already done testing with um, ANSTO for that particular genetic um, fingerprint. We've, we're currently um, testing our fruit with NMI, another partner that we're working with, and ILC generously funding that kind of um, investment so that we can be um, 
leaders, you know, in, in this area. I'm connected to Slow Food. And Slow Food International is all about good, clean and fair, but it's also about the arc of taste, so protecting species that are um, traditional foods for us. And one of my roles was registering the Pindan Walnut and the Gubbinia's got to get on there too, you know? So Gubbinia's our name for the Terminalia Ferdinandiana. And because it grows across northern Australia from Broome, actually into south of Broome, all the way across to western Queensland, can you imagine the amount of language groups that's actually there? And so that one little fruit has got a different name as it crosses into the different boundaries. So that in itself is very key for branding and you'll find that the species, so we've got a lot of research and development opportunities that need to happen. So we can do the fingerprinting, we can do the nutritional aspects, we want to look at the soil, we want to look at the microbes. So um, all of that, we're starting the process. But of course, anything like that costs money and the ILSC can't be the only ones funding it. You know, we need other people to invest in that space. And to, to, you know, native foods is actually the Australian cuisine. We are the first foods. So bringing, you know, cabbages and corn and all those sort of things into the Australian landscape, you are bringing alien plants in. And so what are they looking at? The poor soil that has happened over bad practice for so long. They're looking at the nutrients that's lost because they've been um, using wrong varieties, perhaps. So we've already got that packed up in these beautiful little plums and it happens with all of our fruits too. Mm -hmm. So we need to do something like the orphan um, plants of, of Australia, mm -hmm. but we need it to be indigenous um, involved because for too long we've been excluded from that marketplace and excluded from driving mm -hmm. it forward. Um, we can't do it on our own because we don't have the resources. Um, but we've definitely, we've got the cultural resources and we've got the people who's interested. We, um, so we need investment from other people. Mm. Thanks. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I think it was oh. all that dancing, Suzanne, but I think <laughs> it, it? energised the, uh, <laughs> the audience. So, uh, you know, I believe we can all be really proud of our rich cultural heritage and the knowledge of Australia's Indigenous people. But as we've heard a couple of times or many times today, we must learn how to build strong partnerships uh, that respect and protect our cultural integrity of the important and ancient uh, plants that we've got available to us. Uh, but I think the opportunity is, is infinite, really. And we really strongly encourage those of you... I think we've got a slide to go up on the, on the screen, if that's OK. Um, I can see it down here. There it is. Um, so this kickstarting the Australian native food industry was a deliberate name. We wanted to see this as a beginning point, a starting point. We're so uh, excited to be here at Global Table. It gives us that international perspective as well. If anyone here would like to get more involved or to express interest to participate, there's going to be a whole range of initiatives that come out of this. Andy's made reference uh, to one of them around the database. There's a lot more initiatives about to get underway. Um, so you can see there's a link up there. If you go into that link, click on express your interest, uh, we'd certainly love to hear from you. So if I could just ask you to thank what I think has been an amazing panel. You can all be proud, we can all be proud that this is a really sophisticated industry. It's not some backyard job that, you know, is just only a niche industry. It's something that uh, really has got great global potential. So thank you.